Okay, hi everybody. We are live uh, with Sarah Bessie today. I'm really excited that you guys are here and I'm excited that we have an amazing guest today. Uh, we're just gonna jump right in. Um, so let's just get going here. Sarah, are you there with us? I think yes. so. I think right. so anyway, hi. Awesome, everybody, this is Sarah Bessie. I don't probably really need to introduce her because you know, we're all we're all big fans of this amazing woman. <laughs> <laughs> Not all, <but> thank you. <laughs> well, we are. That's good news. Thank You're you. in safe grounds here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to just jump right in, um, Sarah. If you wouldn't mind just taking a minute and just sharing with our community a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do, and a little bit about your ministry. Since the Dark Ages, um, I was telling Sarah that I might be one of the grannies of the blogosphere at this point, because um, I think I've, how many years now? Is that 15 years? I don't know, something like that. Uh, I do a lot of speaking and preaching, and so I travel all around Canada and the United States, um, sometimes over into uh, the UK as well. I'm actually heading to Ireland next year, so that'll be fun to see all of our Irish girls. Um yeah, and so I'm a wife and a mom. I have four children. Uh, we live in a small city just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. Um, and I think that's probably probably about it. Is there anything I'm missing, Sierra? I mean, that sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of work on um, as well with nonprofits um, that work in developing nations as well. And that's just uh, something that's really dear to my heart. So I work with a maternity center in Haiti, oh. as well as um, another organization called Help One Now um, that's active in seven different nations uh, looking at the empowerment of families and communities. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, you know, you said something that I kind of want to talk a little bit about. Um you wrote a book called Jesus Feminist, which is one of my favorite books of all time. Um, oh. It's it was it was a life changing book for me. And one thing I love about it is um, one I'm a big fan of your style of writing. Um, it's literally like that feeling you get when you're like drinking like the world's greatest cup of tea in like a warm blanket on a fall afternoon. You know what I mean? <laughs> like that is like, the best <laughs> feeling, and that's how I feel when I read your books because you write you write in such a way that just draws people in and is so comfortable and is welcoming and inclusive. And I love that. Um, but uh, I want to talk about the F word uh, because in a lot of Christian communities, you hear feminists and people are like, Oh dear God, like, no, we don't, we don't use those. We don't use that word. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how that, how being a Jesus feminist has affected your ministry? Um, and even um, if that's affected how people, um, welcome you or whatever in the Christian community? Uh, sure. Um, well, you know, I wrote Jesus Feminist um, back in 2012. So it's it's been a little while. So And that was often uh, really tied to a lot of the more public work that I do uh, now, was really uh, blogging and leading up to that. Um, and then, of course, writing, writing the book and having it come out. So a lot of my work has been really tied to that um, Tied to the F word, I guess, is probably what you would what you would say. And even even the title itself was um, not the original title of the book. Um, I had something else that was quite flowery and no doubt completely forgettable, given the fact that I've even forgotten it. Um, <laughs> so it was um, a chapter title in the manuscript that I wrote. And, um, and we just all of a sudden thought, you know what, I think that's I think that's really what it is, because the label or the name Jesus Feminist really rose out of my life and out of conversations. Um, mm. I uh, had always identified as a feminist. It wasn't really uh, a big deal for me. Um, I think that sometimes that's, um, you know, it, has, it gives me a, maybe a unique perspective sometimes in these conversations because it didn't feel very much like I needed to clutch my pearls about it, yeah. right? It was just a, a really natural sort of thing. Well, of course, I care about women's equality, and I had since I was a child. Um, and so moving through my adulthood, though, we moved to the States for a number of years. And it was funny because people would say, you know, I'd, I'd say it. I'd say, well, of course, I'm a feminist. And people would sort of have that drawing back reaction that I wasn't really expecting or sort of pre uh, prepared for. Yeah. And so they would initially sort of look at me and say, well, what kind of feminist? 
I think because they had this stereotype tricked out in their mind of what they thought a feminist was or what a mm-hmm. feminist should look like or how they should be. Um, and and even that is a lot of, you know, misinformation. I had very similar conversations um, with non-Christian friends here in Western Canada where I would say, yes, I'm a Christian. And they would kind of draw back and say, well, what kind of a Christian? Because their idea of it was oftentimes, you know, the stereotype that they see on American news media about evangelicals. And so that didn't do me any favors either. Right. right. And so I think that there's equal opportunity to tick almost everybody off with a, a word like that. But when it, they would ask me, they'd say, what sort of feminist are you? Um, my reaction just kind of honestly in a bit of a cheeky way was to say, oh, I'm a Jesus feminist. And to me that meant, and I wanted the church to know that I was a feminist precisely because I loved Jesus so yeah. much, that I wasn't a feminist in spite of Jesus or in uh, tension with Jesus, that yes. instead this was an invitation that I had had met and had discovered and found in Jesus, yeah. and that it was because I loved Jesus that this was something that had reawoken or had woken up in my heart and was really uh, incredibly dear to me. And so then it just sort of took off from there, and we um, wrote the book and had that, um, you know, honestly resonated with way more people than I think I ever would have expected. And it's just been such a gift because then you get a chance to walk alongside people of realizing that there isn't um, a conflict there. But instead, oftentimes, um, really what we're doing is living into God's invitation that's already there Mm -hmm. and um, and healing that. Right. And so, yeah, yeah, it's just been a a really beautiful journey in that regard. And so, I mean, nobody was really too surprised by me using the word feminist now. Um, Five years ago, it was a big deal. (laughs) And I think that there has been a lot of work um, that not just myself, but a tremendous amount of scholars and theologians and writers and artists and, you know, regular people in churches who have sort of reclaimed um, our spot at that table and being able to have those conversations. And I I see the acceptability um, moving way up across the board. And so for me, I think that's very hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that you've been a feminist or at least um, known that you believed in equality since you were really young. Um, How has your um, perspective on on, um, feminism and even egalitarianism and equality for men and women, like how has that evolved over the years, like into adulthood? Oh, I think in a number of ways. I mean, you know, there's there's been a lot of ways where my feminism has evolved since I wrote Jesus Feminist. I mean, honestly, there are things I would go back and, and say differently or or or, um, or revisit or reintroduce. Um, you know, like there's nothing in the book about intersexualism, mm-hmm. right? And so you you think about these sorts of conversations, which are really um, very pertinent, especially right now. Um, you know, and, and maybe back in 2012, that was not where I was at, or maybe it was not even, you know, we were still in early days of those things. But I mean, there's a lot of ways. I think that it's like really anything else in your life. If you're not growing and changing and responding and evolving, then you're really not paying attention. Yeah. You know, none of us have really arrived fully at any point. We're all on some sort of a journey or continuum. And I think that staying um, curious and staying open to listening, um, to being willing to ex- examine even our own blind spots. Um, only enhances and enriches um, not only our testimony and our faith and our experiences and understanding of God, but our experiences and understanding of each other. Uh, Learning those things, you know what, honestly, it was a gift to me. Um, And it really, I felt deepened, uh, not only my feminism, but even my spirituality and my faith. Yeah, I love that. I love that you said, um, you know, paying attention to even our blind spots, Mm -hmm. uh, because we all have them. We do. We yeah, all have them, too. you know, yeah. and we all have things that we're learning on in, in that yeah. regard, things that come easily to us and things that we have to uh, learn. And that is almost, I believe, really part of the invitation of the Holy Spirit for uh, not only our transformation, but for the transformation of the world. Yeah. Right. That we're not just looking at it as this end game of having all the right opinions and ticking all the right boxes. There's purpose yeah. for that sort of transfer transformation. Um. I know this isn't one of the questions that I mentioned to you that I'd be asking you, but I just feel like I wanted to ask you, um, a lot of us really struggle, um, in our community, um, with having, com- having these conversations with people who don't understand us, um, or believe, you know, we, you know, some of us get called Jezebels on the daily, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, um, I do. <laughs> how do you, how do you navigate that? Because I've, I've watched you online for a really long time and, 
you handle conflict and you handle people so beautifully. And you, I feel like you honor people who dishonor you and you, um, I don't know. Do you have like any, just any thoughts you could share? Cause I know our, our community really struggles with a lot, you know, a lot of people are even afraid of like letting people know they follow our page because of the backlash they'll get, um, from family and friends, you know, so how do you, how would you advise people that are in that situation? Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, I think that, I think that sometimes it's, it's hard to offer something that's, that's super prescriptive, um, you know, to that, right? I mean, oftentimes to me, I feel like this is, and, and I mean, if anybody has read Jesus Feminist, they know that I definitely lean heavy on the woo woo you know, sort of <laughs> Jesus y stuff, right? I'm here for it. I'm here for it all the time. Yeah. And so for me, I feel like it's a, a deeply, um, uh, and ca- a deep encounter with the Holy Spirit of knowing what to do and what to say and when to say it and when to stand up and when to step back, um, what it means to um, to follow that sort of leading or follow that sort of uh, of inclination to me is something that now comes much more naturally and easily to me. Um, but I feel like it's almost like a muscle that you sort of work out. And sometimes you learn it by doing it wrong. Yeah. Right. And so and there's there's no fear in that. There's no fear even in that failure. Um, I think that oftentimes that's where, to me, a, a really strong grounding in your identity in knowing who you are, knowing what can and cannot be taken from you yeah. um, is a really key part of, of engaging oftentimes in conflict, uh, whether it's with, you know, strangers online or people in your real life or, um, you know, what what sort of to do. I mean, and honestly, everybody has kind of their a different way of knowing um, what to say and how to say it depends on who you're talking to. Um, one of the things I have found really key for me um, since becoming uh, more of a, a public leader in the last, uh, you know, five or, or eight years or whatever it is, I can't remember. I should probably think about that for a second, but... Um, is that there's a really big difference between criticism or pushback and having someone troll you or be a hater. Yeah. And to me, learning how to receive even good pushback or good criticism, oftentimes my critics have made me better. They've made me stronger. They've made me clearer. They've made me have to think through what I really believe and why. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, And there's a big difference between someone who's thoughtfully engaging you from a place of respect and love and mutual learning um, versus someone who's just you know, trolling or, you know, whatever. I mean, f- plus I find that those sorts of labels like troll and hater to be too easily misapplied to anybody who disagrees with us. And so then yeah. that becomes dehumanizing as well. Mm-hmm. But I think, um, you know, there are always going to be people who misunderstand. There are always going to be people who misrepresent and who don't really want to learn, who really do have a very fixed idea of what that is. And so for me, when it comes down to engaging in conflict, um, a lot of times the wisdom that I'm looking to receive or the wisdom I'm looking to um, receive from the Holy Spirit is, uh, is where is there an open door to begin to sow shalom here? Mm, because yeah. to me, the end game is not necessarily changing someone's mind so they agree 100% with me, as much as it is thinking, what is what is what is God's heart in this situation? And it's not just for right opinions, it's for peacemaking, and it is for wholeness, and it is for there to be the fruit of the Spirit operating in, in everybody's life. Yeah. And oftentimes, we don't realize the seeds that we are sowing by our kindness and our gentleness and our patience and our love and our joy even, yeah. right? Like, I think that sometimes we miss over, miss the resistance of joy and what yeah. that means and the invitation of that. And so, for me, it's not just about um, winning the argument as much as it is uh, seeing the long game of the kingdom of God, which is all things restored and everybody, everybody being renewed and resurrected and all these things sort of happening, right? Yeah. And so, oftentimes, those disagreements or those places are places where I'm sowing seeds for the kingdom of God, even if we walk away and somebody completely misunderstands and they don't get it and they call me a Jezebel. I have I remember there was like a book that wrote a whole chapter on me calling me an evil leftist menace to the gospel. Oh, <laughs> right? like, at some point, you just have to laugh about it and say, oh, you know what? You just have to carry on, right? You can't be distracted things. You can't let these slings and arrows of these things sort of distract you from what's really going on, which yeah. is that you're participating with God in the renewal of all things. Wow. I feel like I should give you a pulpit. 
<laughs> just go sit down somewhere else for a while. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I know that's that's something that our community. Oh, looks like our broadcast just got paused for a sec. There we go, and we're back. Um, something our that is really something our community um, has you know really struggled with. Um, a lot of people are either new to egalitarianism or are still figuring out their egalitarianism or their feminism. Um, and they get so much pushback from their churches from, I mean, I've, I've met women, um, who have been asked to leave churches recently, women who, um, have husbands that have been asking them for divorce. Um, I mean, just the, the stories I'm hearing, um, because of this is just, it's just crazy to me. So I really appreciate you taking the time to, sh to talk to our, to our community about that for a minute. Um, no, it is. I think that there's a lot of, um, of grief oftentimes that that accompanies that right and I think that um, that those women are not alone yeah. right and, and, and even then there's a lot of men also who, who kind of have a lot of um, you know similar pushback or you know things of, of, of those sorts of things I think that's why it's so deeply important to have places like Azer Rising or a community of friends or a church um, of people who can come alongside you and just help you remember that you're not as alone or as crazy as people think <laughs> right? That what's normal for this small group of people is not necessarily what's actually normative for the kingdom of God. And so, even being able to, to have that sort of support, to have that sort of comradeship, to have friendship um, with people who are alongside of you in that, who are praying for you, uh, yeah. who are supporting you, who are able to laugh with you and give you a place to um, sort of process it. Um, especially when you feel like you're under attack, I think is a, is a really, really key thing, right? Yeah, I think that's good. I feel like I'm just going to like write on my mirror in the morning. You're not as crazy as people think you are. <laughs> Be my mantra for my life now, moving hey, forward. You know Go ahead and take that. <laughs> it can happen. It can happen. Um, so I guess my next question off of that is, you know, there's all these issues in the world. There are a billion things we could all be passionate about. So why why is equality for women so important to you? I mean, you're a woman, so there's that. But I mean, outside of the fact that you're a woman, um, what makes this so important for you? What makes this be a huge chunk of your life? Um, you know, there's a number a number of reasons I think why that is. Um, you know, I I think that, um, I mean, you can look at things like, you know, even the, the book Half the Sky, right, where you can see, you know, all these statistics and all these stories and all these reasons and why it is that when you empower and educate and raise up women worldwide, what that does to communities, what it does to education, what it does to society. I mean, there's there's the scientific basis for it is, is 100% there. Yeah. But for me... Um, as compelling as I find, you know, statistics as much as the next girl. Um, there is also this aspect of re really wanting to remember um, that behind all those statistics are stories. Yeah. Right. That's and and there, there's a person behind every single one of those numbers. And when you talk even uh, just in your last question about, uh, you know, women who are being persecuted or cast out or shunned, women who are oftentimes being abused um, in so many different capacities. I mean, for me, um, it just feels like as someone who knows and follows Jesus, who is wanting to have a life that is shaped by Jesus, um, there's just nothing that is right about this. And there's almost this sense of like, women are made in the image of God. And this this damages God's uh, intention, God's dream even for humanity. I mean, yeah. one of the things that I, I believe just so deeply in the core of my soul is that patriarchy damages everybody. Yes. That it doesn't matter if you think you are the powerful white woman who you know, has so internalized misogyny that you think you're fine <laughs> and you don't need feminism and then the need is passed, right? Like from your privilege or whatever else it is. Yeah. Um, you know, to a woman who's in a developing nation who has no legal standing or power. I mean, there's, 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 um, you know, the effect of it on men. I mean, there's just, there's so many different reasons why you can see those things. But honestly, in my heart of hearts, I think the reason why I've always cared and the reason why I think I'll probably always care is because I believe it's not in line with what Jesus and what, what God really had in mind for us as humanity. And it just seems like such an affront and almost like a, a, a blasphemous thing against the image of God in women. 
Um, And so being able to engage in that, however small or however large, to me is really part of, um, of renewal and healing. And, uh, and I think that that's really the work that we have. Yeah, that's great. You know, you talk a lot about, I mean, well, we, we all talk about Jesus because honestly, Jesus treated women. Um, Amy Lipka, a, a girl on our team, um, has said a few times, Jesus treated women radically. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I love that phrase that has stuck with me a lot. Um, and I, I'd really love to hear from you, um, where, what are some of like your favorite examples in scripture, um, where Jesus or even Paul, um, who's like the, the dude we all love to pummel because, you know, we misinterpret all of Paul's scripture for whatever reason to make it sound like he hated women. Paul did not hate women. Um, you know, what are, what are some of your favorite examples of how Jesus or Paul, you know, um, favored women and treated women radically for the culture and the time period that they were in? Um, you know, honestly, there's, there's so many different ones. <laughs> there's, it, it was funny. There was a, a book that my, um, that was more for one of my eldest, my eldest daughters um, in middle school. And there was a book that, um, you know, came across uh, my desk that was for middle school women, uh, girls about the women in the Bible, kind of re- recasting them as heroes. It was a great book. And she got stuck reading it. And it was, of course, all the usual women in the Bible was Miriam and Elizabeth and Esther and whatever else. And I, you know, went to her room later that night and she had finished the book. And I said, um, I said, Annie, I said, which woman did you really like? Like, who did you like, you know, Mary, the mother of God? Do you like Mary Magdalene? Um, I've always really loved Mary Magdalene, first preacher of the resurrection. You know, like just you have all these women that you kind of just are, are drawn towards. And she's like, I love the guy, the girl who put the tent peg through the guy's skull. <laughs> Yes. That's my girl. <laughs> you know, so, JL. J- JL. Win. Yeah, exactly. Hashtag JL forever. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah, it just made my day. So, I mean, there's a million different stories of women in the Bible that I just find so incredibly compelling um, and encounters with Jesus that I just find so beautiful. Mary and Martha, Mary Magdalene, um, just in so many different ways. Um, rereading and relearning the story of the woman at the well through a feminist interpretation was yeah. transformative for me because for so long I had heard her kind of painted as like this harlot, this woman of sin. And instead, all of a sudden you realize, you know, what we've kind of done to this story and this woman and how we've changed. I mean, just honestly, there's just some incredible books and and articles on that subject. Yeah. Um, Nadia Nadia Boltz Weber wrote one or has a teaching that is one of the hands down best, best teachings I've ever heard on the woman at the well. I would not be surprised. Nadia is an amazing teacher. I could she listen to her is. honestly probably preach the phone book and end up transformed. So yeah. Um, yeah. Anyways, you know, going. that one's a good one. I mean, the one that honestly, the last little while I've been wrestling with probably the most um, as I've been writing uh, my third book, right uh, in the, the last little while here um, was this little story that happened with a Canaanite woman with Jesus. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I was wrestling with it is because I hated it. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has these moments, like when you're reading the Bible and you're just like, um, this doesn't sound so great. And you yeah. kind of almost either ignore it and skip over it because it doesn't line up with your presuppositions of who you think Jesus is or who you think, you know, how you think this should be going, or you have an invitation in it. And so I find that oftentimes when I'm reading scripture, if I feel that sort of resistance, um, of wanting to either normalize it or rationalize it or explain it away instead of sitting in the discomfort or the tension that oftentimes actually discomfort is an invitation from the Holy Spirit. Yes. Right? Lean into yes. that and to, to follow good. that trail a little bit, right? Yes. So there's this story of this woman who's a Canaanite woman so despised by the Jewish um, community there. And she is chasing after Jesus, yelling because her daughter's sick. And she is chasing after the disciples, making a huge fuss. So she has all these things against her. She's a woman. She's from this despised, um, you know, a socio-ethnic group. And she is being ignored. They find her annoying. She is chasing after the disciples and making such a fuss that she wants Jesus to pay attention to her. And he continues to ignore her and ignore her and ignore her and ignore her. This is very early in his ministry. And the disciples finally say to Jesus, you have got to deal with this woman because she is driving us insane. You have got to take care of this because she's not going away. 
And so he ends up talking to her and she asks him to heal her daughter. And he tells her um, that it's not right for the child, the bread for the children to be given to the dogs, mm. implying that she's a dog in this situation. And man, that made me nuts. It made me nuts because I was just like, this does not sound like Jesus. This does not sound like something Jesus would say. And so, and then she ends up responding to him and saying, but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the table. And he says, your faith has made your daughter well and and ends up healing her daughter and away she goes. And so I began to read about it and study it and was like, God, this is just driving me just crazy. And so I ended up reading and studying it for a little bit longer. And I'm still wrestling with it, to be honest, which is probably why it jumped to the top of my mind. Um, And there's all these different interpretations around it, right? That Jesus was play acting, that he was kind of demonstrating how foolish, you know, racism is and sexism is, that he was almost play acting how he should have responded given the culture and then showing everybody how wrong it was, which, you know, that could definitely be the case. And there's, you know, there were a a lot of other responses and ways to understand it, ways to explain it away. Um, I remember reading one that said that the word he used for dog is actually endearing, like puppies. And I'm like, "Mm, no, there's no way to make that endearing. (laughs) You know, nice try. Thanks thanks for playing, you know. (laughs) And instead, the one that really has captured my heart um, and and, an idea, I mean, you don't know for sure, obviously, is that Jesus was learning. Hmm. That Jesus was taught by her. That he was challenged. That he still was, because he was as fully human as he was divine, that there was this sense of him responding based on his context and how he understood and learned things. And that really he responded in learning. And never, ever again in scripture did you see him talk to a woman or to someone who was a minority in that sort of prideful, dismissive way, right? And so even just the sense of like, huh. Right. Like here's this woman who had tremendous faith, who was challenging, who was not silenced by her lack of of power in any capacity and just kept chasing for her daughter, which, of course, I find incredibly, um, you know, just I I mean, you get it right. There's as a mom, I can't think of too many other parents that, you know, who wouldn't go chasing down after anybody in the street if there was half a chance your child could be saved. Right. And so and then to begin to see it as maybe this idea of Jesus was um, was open to being taught and mm-hmm. was and and was was changed. Um, I find that really fascinating and, and, and exciting. Okay. Right. And so yeah. anyway, that's something that's probably a bit more than you needed to know. <laughs> no, I love that. That's that's actually a perspective I've actually never even considered. So that's why we have these conversations. This is so. <laughs> this is why like this is why dialogue and conversation with people I think is so important because we always get to challenge each other's like minds and just even our own perceptions of Jesus sometimes. You I know. know. I mean, there's just so many different ones. There was one where Jesus encounters the um, the woman who's bent over in the temple, and he calls yeah. her daughter of Abraham. Yeah. I mean, the first time I figured out what a big deal that was, because there had never been daughters of Abraham. It was only ever sons of Abraham, right? And in front of, like, God and everybody in the temple, he confers on her. Not only does he heal her and say that if there's, you know, is is it not right for a daughter of Abraham, does she not have as much value as a sheep you would save? I mean, so challenging the misogyny in the room, challenging the patriarchy, challenging the religious leaders and all of these, you know, the, the millstone and weight that they were putting around people's necks. But then even her identity, right? Calling her daughter of Abraham, she had equal status, equal billing. She had just as much right to the inheritance as any of the men standing in that room. I mean, that's electrifying. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. I've never thought, I, again, things I just haven't thought about. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Everybody's like probably taking all these notes. (laughs) Um, Well, we probably need to get closing up here. And I literally could feel everybody watching going, oh, man. Um, (laughs) But we're, we are giving away two of Sarah's books. We're going to be giving away a copy of Jesus Feminist and a copy of Out of Sorts. Um, and in order to be included in that giveaway, we just need you guys to make sure you're subscribed to our newsletter. Uh, we dropped the link in there. Um, and we'll be choosing two random people um, from our email list. Um, Sarah, would you mind taking like, I don't know, 30 to 30 seconds to a minute and just share with um, our community a little bit about each book? Um, what's important about each book and 
you know, why they should go buy it because they're both amazing. <laughs> um, but just from your perspective, like the heart behind each book so that they know what they're getting in for. Uh, sure. Um, uh, Jesus Feminist to me, um, right from the start. And I think that that's one of the things um, with the book is that at the time when I was writing it, I really felt like um, a lot of the conversations around women's equality, especially uh, in the church or in, uh, in you know, their community, whether it was in their marriage or, you know, in, in uh, their, you know, just their regular walking around life. A lot of those conversations are kind of done in an academic sense. Right. There's not a lot of Christian academics who don't hold to an egalitarian viewpoint. Um, yeah. But I felt like it never really kind of trickled down to the rest of us, you know. And so for me, even going into it, it wasn't necessarily that I was wanting to write, you know, a book of, of Christian feminist theory. And I think anybody who's read it would probably be able to say, yes, we know. Yeah. <laughs> it certainly yeah. isn't that. <laughs> yeah. But to me, it was only ever an invitation really to the kingdom of God. That it was a sense of invitation to here's what life looks like when you um, have said yes, when you have leaned into God's yes for women. Here's what it means for the world. Here's what it means for your marriage. Here's what it means for, um, you know, your relationships, your friendships, for as you're raising children, if you have children, if you're, you know, pastoring in your church. I mean, there's a lot of implications for this sort of freedom. And so for me, I think going into it, I always wanted it to be about freedom. I wanted it to be about, um, I think, recentering even um, those conversations instead of, you know, making it its small side thing um, that I wanted to sort of recenter. No, 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 this isn't a secondary issue. This is this is really deeply tied to our discipleship. This yeah. is really deeply tied to how we follow Jesus. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that I wanted, um, I remember writing the last chapter of the book, which is more of a prayer uh, or a benediction, um, and just really weeping because I felt like I could... Um, and the, the, the message that I felt so strongly in my heart from the Holy Spirit was, we need to stop waiting for permission. Mm. And so to me, I feel like even the culmination of that is if you stop waiting for someone else to validate you, to say that you have worth and to say that you matter, to say that you get to have a voice, because you know what? God has already done all of those things for you and in you and through you. And so at that point, you're not looking for that validation from someone else to give you permission to live out your created and called and chosen self. Yeah. And then what does that mean, right? Yeah. And so that's really where that book kind of came from and where it is. Um, it's not a perfect book, <laughs> Pretty but great I'm, still, though. I'm still very <laughs> fond of it. <laughs> yeah. And then the second book actually arose uh, from conversations I was having um, after Jesus Feminist, because it was then that I began to sort of travel and speak and talk, and I would go to university campuses and churches and conferences, and it didn't matter where I went, all over North America, there was this one little bit that I had said um, in Jesus Feminist where I mentioned the fact that I didn't go to church for about six years, and that I had a bit of a complicated relationship with church. Um, and then, of course, that I um, am a really devout local church person now, right? I'm like straight up church lady. <laughs> and so people, you know, we would have these Q&As, we would have these conversations, and then inevitably by the end of it, someone would say, I need you to talk to me about that. I need you to talk to me about what it means when you shift, about what it means when your faith shifts, when your theology shifts, when the answers that you used to have no longer make sense. Because oftentimes egalitarianism or feminism is really one branch in the thicket of questions and struggles and problems we have. You can't separate it or, um, you know, cut it off from, uh, you know, our questions around race or politics or around justice or around all of these other things that we are struggling with, how we read scripture, what we, what we think about the Bible. Um, you know, all these things are all tangled up and you can't ever separate them out and act like they're not, you know, connected. Yeah. And so I really just wanted to write the book I wished I would have had 15 years ago. I mean, to be honest, I mean, there was this sense of, okay, when all your answers don't make sense anymore, when you feel like you're out of sorts, when you feel like all the foundation that you've had, or you have a lot of questions, I think that sometimes we think we only have two options, right? That our option is either to double down and pretend that we don't have any questions, stick our fingers in our ears, it's fine, we're fine, everything's fine. Right. <laughs> 
not fine, but we like to pretend it's fine. And oftentimes fine. we'll become even more strident fundamentalists yeah. in that space, right? Or we think we have to burn it down and walk away entirely and just, you know, completely depart from the church, depart from your faith, depart from Jesus, depart from all of it. And I felt wanted to help find that third way of saying, no, 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 you don't have to choose intellectual and spiritual dishonesty to pursue truth. Mm. And that that is actually something I believe the Holy Spirit is inviting us into. And so it was never meant to be a book about, you know, you've not got all the answers. So here's a nice new set of answers. It was more about, I think, an invitation to the journey and being able to see that this is um, something that's good and right and a big part of your development. And you're exactly where you needed to be to go on those sorts of journeys. Oh, now now I want to go read them both again. <laughs> I probably will. <laughs> um, so, yeah, y'all um, can buy Sarah's books on Amazon. Um, Sarah, can they buy them directly from you? On no, your I, I think you no. Know, I've always just much preferred to support okay. bookstores. All right, cool. Sort of, yeah, All right. just wherever they grab them, every bookstore has them usually. Cool. Well, I bought mine at Barnes and Noble, except for the Christian bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> I work. I work for a Christian <laughs> publisher, so I'm like, I'm like, yes, I understand. <laughs> um, yeah, don't go to the Christian bookstores because they probably won't be there. However. <laughs> They're at Barnes and Noble because I bought my copies there. there you, um, you can also go on Amazon.com and order them there. Um, again, um, subscribe to our newsletter, and we'll make sure that we pick two people um, to get a copy of Sarah's one of Sarah's books. Um, yeah, I think that's about what we have time for. We went a little over, so I appreciate you um, just taking extra time to talk to with us and and share your heart. Um, we all think you're pretty amazing, so it's it means a lot to us that you're here. So, oh, so honored to be here. I'm just cheering you guys on every, every day. I'm just so thankful you all give me such hope. It's Aww. good to be along. It's good to be alongside each other, I think. Yeah. And I think that's, that's something I really try to cultivate with Azer Rising is that we're not in competition with anyone else. Like Junior Project, CBE, Sarah Bessie, Rachel Held Evans, Azer Rising, Ashley Easter, Jory Micah. We're all just doing the same thing. We're all after the same thing. And it's not... There's just no competition here. No, you're on the same team. We're just all going for the same stuff. And that's what I think is so important. Um, so, yeah. So, thank you for being with us today. Um, and you guys can play back the video if you missed something or had to step away. You can. Well, this will be available um, in a couple of minutes. And you guys can watch it again later. So, thank you guys for watching. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>